EK is best known for its open-loop liquid cooling components, as we show at CES every year in the company's bombastic display of systems. But that's a small market. EK has been trying to get into closed-loop liquid cooling for years, and they keep kind of doing it and then backing out or doing weird hybrid approaches. This one is the company's latest attempt. The EK AIO DRGB solution was delayed on several occasions, but it has finally arrived. Human malware was one of the reasons for the de delay. But today we're reviewing the 360 and the 240 mil variants of the new closed loop liquid coolers from EK. Our testing will look at thermals for noise normalized performance, 100% fan speed performance if you want flat out. We have cold plate levelness measured in microns on the deviation point to point. And then we have the efficacy on both Intel and AMD platforms for a multi-die versus a monolithic die cooling arrangement. So lots to get through today. Before that, this video is brought to you by Team Group's T-Force Extreme ARGB memory, which uses a frosted finish on its heatsink to diffuse the lighting across the surface. The Extreme ARGB kits are available in various XMP configurations, including 3200, 16, 18, 18, and 4000, 18, 22, 22. If you're looking for an ARGB memory kit for your next build, check out the link in the description below for the T-Force Extreme memory. So first of all, we have a separate teardown coming up on these. We kind of ran these in parallel, so that content's getting edited right now, but it'll be up shortly. Make sure you subscribe to catch it. We've got the pieces on the table still. The most important point, other than a couple others we're going to go through in the teardown in more detail, is the surface area of the microfin. So this has a big impact on performance, and this is going to be a lot of the reason you see the performance that you see in today's review at the noise levels you see. So uh, there's a lot more to closed loop liquid coolers than Asetek would have you believe. Asetek is one of the primary suppliers for CLCs. You see Corsair, NZXT, EVGA, they historically have all used Asetek. Corsair is moving away, they're going more towards cool it. But the point we'll be making today is that some uh, engineering or some innovation from these other companies trying to circumvent getting sued by Asetek for patents has actually led to better performance. So that's something we're going to talk about. Pricing is $155 for the 360 version of the EKAO DRGB solution, which is a terribly hard name to say over and over, and then $120 for the 240 mil variant. For perspective, the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2, which we recently reviewed as the best performing cooler we had yet tested on our new methodology, uh, that's $95 for the 280 mil version, which is a steal. So EK is certainly not price competitive here, but we'll see if the performance matches up or if there's other features that may potentially justify that pricing. Separately, big air coolers are also included in these. We won't be focusing on them too much, but they're in the charts if you want them. All right, there's a lot to go through. Let's get through the marketing, the installation procedure, and then a whole lot of thermal and noise numbers, cold plate levelness, and then we'll talk conclusions. We often talk about product marketing to set the tone for our review. EK's marketing overall is rather technical and bland which is perfect. That's what we like. That means it's probably more accurate, or in the very least, it's less likely to talk about how it uses biomimetics and the silhouette of a spider to improve performance or something like that. EK mostly tries to leverage its open loop competence in marketing its CLCs, appealing to authority in one space to try and establish a foothold in a newer one. This is a common strategy and thus far, we haven't read anything horribly out of line or over marketed. That said, of course, this is new for them. So just being good at open loop doesn't mean they're going to be good at CLCs, and that's something to keep in mind. When we have stuff in the back of our mind, like what happened with Enermax's CLCs, they say, EK, that it's a pre-filled pump res combo designed for a liquid cooling solution that's ready to go straight out of the box, which is all accurate. That's fine. The res is the tank on the rad. The rest is obvious. The only place EK deviates from the objective sense is to talk about its RGB lighting on the acrylic cover claiming that it's a, quote, light diffuser with a frosted finish for a dynamic lighting display with smooth color transitions. We think, frankly, that this is a fantastic way to disguise the fact that it looks like it was made in someone's shed on their 3D printer. But that's not particularly relevant to its performance, so we'll let you judge the looks yourself. EK also advertises compatibility with several pieces of fine bloatware from motherboard manufacturers. So if Asus, Gigabyte, MSI, and ASRock security liabilities are something you want to install in your system, it'll work with them. The product page and marketing are boring overall, which is good, so we'll just move on. There's really nothing to nail them for here. To briefly mention internals, we have a complete separate teardown video coming up shortly that'll talk about how the EK AIO series works and how it's assembled. So you should check back and subscribe to the channel to make sure you catch that when it goes up. The short version, the biggest item of note, is that it's running a larger diameter plastic impeller as compared to the smaller Asetek CLC impellers and the medium-sized Arctic metal impeller. 
The EKAIO also uses a gigantic electromagnet for the pump, something that we'll look at separately in the teardown. The installation procedure is trivial with EK's AIO series, as we've come to expect from most liquid coolers. It tends to be the air coolers, like Zalman's CNPS20X and its abominable 26 screws to mount, where we see challenges in the mounting hardware. Even Arctic's, though, for liquid cooling was inconvenient, albeit with a very low amount of hardware required, just because it was hard to get everything socketed with only two hands. EK's solution is simple. Two plates are attached to the pump block with four screws. So we're at six parts that should probably be pre-installed for one of the two brands, but that's not offensive. You next thread four standoffs into the AMD stock backplate or socket and Intel backplate, and that puts us at 10 parts from EK. You then drop some springs and some hand-tightened cap screws into place. The springs mean no concern about mounting pressure is needed, just tighten within reason until sufficient resistance is provided, and then stop, or rather, you will be stopped by the springs. This helps standardize the mounting force, and therefore the performance, but also reduces risk of users over-tightening, as can happen with a lot of other products, Acetec included, where you'll just grind the metal off if you keep going. That's it. It's an easy enough process, and it's the same between Intel and AMD, although obviously with some spacing changes. HEDT parts cut down to just the four standoff screws without the need of a backplate, but that's all standard. We're about to get into the thermal testing now, including noise testing. We have a very large CPU cooler testing methodology piece that we've published in both written and video form, so we'll link those in the description below if you want to learn about how we do this. The biggest thing to point out is that noise normalized testing is the driving component of our reviews because it allows us to look at the efficiency of a product and keep the noise the same. Noise normalizing is not fan normalizing though. This is something that people got confused with and that's not how it works. When we say something's noise normalized, it means we installed the cooler in its stock configuration and we set the noise equal to a specific value shown on the chart. We're not changing the fans. Finally, if we call a cooler average in the charts, what we're using here is arithmetic average or the mean of the results. So when we say a cooler's average, it means that it's literally within the average, the mean of coolers that it is compared to. That's something that people also got confused with with the CNPS 20X review. It is not uh, a colloquial speech, it's just quantifying data. Our first chart looks at the more intensive 200 watt heat load as produced by the three dies on the AMD 3950X. We've normalized the noise levels to 35 dBA at 20 inches of distance, creating an equal playing field to test the efficiency of the pumps, the fans, and the radiators without permitting the fans to just brute force performance at the expense of noise. Again, remember that we keep the included fans for this test. In this test, the EKAIO360 ends up as the new chart leader, just ahead of the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 280mm CLC. Note, however, that we don't have the Liquid Freezer 2 360 to test right now, so there'd be some competition size for size. The EK cooler is now the chart topper, technically, and holds a tactical victory over the rest of what we've tested thus far on this AMD platform, so we'll need to turn to our Intel HEDT bench soon to look at three years of CLC data. The EK AIO 240 here runs at about 54 degrees over ambient in our testing, DT over ambient, which ranks it functionally equivalent to the Kraken X62 280 CLC with the older Azatec Gen 5 pump while the EVGA CLC360 and Kraken X72 show poor static pressure performance at the restrictive noise levels that we've set. They just can't overcome the resistance with the noise-constrained RPM. The EKAIO240 at $120 is worse value than the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 280 at its original $95 although its compatibility with size may be something to consider. The same goes for the EKAIO360 at $155, despite its technical victory in noise normalized performance. Our next thermal data considers the VRM temperature. This is the most relevant for air coolers or coolers like the Arctic unit, which has a VRM fan that we need to validate on its marketing claims, but it's still interesting for standard liquid coolers. Liquid coolers are mounted in an equivalent position to the top of a case. So this gives you a look at the expected performance in an equivalent top mount. Likely unsurprisingly, the Liquid Freezer 2 remains the leader in VRM thermals at 35 dBA when everything's normalized. The NHD15 is next, with the Liquid Freezer following that up when its VRM fan is disabled. The wider spread of those 140 fans helps get more even distribution of air across the VRM heat sinks, especially those set back more. The EKAIO series follows that. The EKAIO 240 and 360 are within error and test variants of each other in all three MOSFET thermal measurements. Ultimately, this number doesn't matter too much. It's a technical tally favoring large air coolers that cast air toward VRM heat sinks, like the NHD15 or 
the liquid freezer with its VRM vent. That said, considering we're talking about parts that can run at 100 degrees Celsius and technically still be fine, it's something of a hollow victory under these testing conditions. Know that this chart becomes irrelevant if you mount your EK AIO in the front as you'd be relying on case fans at that point for airflow over the VRM. Our cold plate levelness test is next. This is a unique one for us. For this one, we're using specialized equipment for measuring the depth of the cold plate from a known zero point as tested with a needle that gauges the depth point by point on the cold plate. The depth is measured in microns, and the unachievable but ideal result would be that the depth is the same across the entire cold plate when mounted, ensuring flat contact. Note we specifically said when mounted here, because there will be some warping of the plate to match the curvature of the IHS with some coolers that are better designed. And by the way, the cold plate that we've been showing on the screen while describing this is the one that's included in the EK AIO series. It actually has more surface area. It's taller by about a millionth meter than the NZXT Kraken series with its Asetek cold plates, and it's also wider than both the liquid freezer and the Asetek plates, but we'll look at that in the teardown, which you should definitely check back for for a lot more detail. Here's the chart. This shows the maximum depth measured, the minimum, and quartile results in the box. The EKAIO 360 is comparable to the Noctua NHD15 for point-to-point -point deviations across the surface with an overall higher average depth from zero. The average ends up just under 10 microns, but more importantly, that number is consistent. Our greatest depth is 25 microns on both the 360 and 240 AIOs, with minimums at 1 and 2, respectively. The Corsair A500 has been the worst measured to date, with the highest point-to-point -point variability and greatest excursions from the mean, at 98 microns max. And this is something we confirmed later on another unit, and by the way, Corsair confirmed it as well with early samples. That's what contributed to that cooler's poor performance, at least, the A500. This next chart allows the fans to operate at full speed, so we're now disregarding the noise and allowing the cooler to show its full potential with stock fans. We ran an extra configuration for this one. The pre-applied paste on the EK AIO 360 measured almost identically to our standardized application and paste. For at least the AMD Ryzen IHS size, we'd say that EK's pre-applied paste is fine and that you should feel no quarrels with using it as is. The EK AIO 360 runs at 51.4 dBA at 20 inches distance, led only by the EVGA CLC 360 cooler at 60.4 dBA. You can see how much the results change based on the noise level only. The CLC 360 did horribly relative to its size in the 35 dBA test, although it does comparatively better at 40 dBA in our Intel HDT testing coming up. But it does maintain a lead at its deafening 60.4 dBA 100% speeds in this chart. The most interesting data is the EK AIO 240 which manages to equal the Kraken X72 and outperform the Kraken X62. The Liquid Freezer 2's lower ranking result is expected, and at its noise level of 42.5 dBA, it is significantly more efficient and effective than either NZXT Kraken cooler and than the EK AIO240, which is at 46.6 dBA. That said, the NZXT coolers and their older Asetek Gen 5 design are starting to show their age. The Kraken X63, not shown here in our Intel HEDT bench testing, didn't make any thermal improvements from the pump, just the fans. So Asetek looks to be presently in a disadvantaged position versus newer designs. Turns out that suing all your competition out of the market only works so long before it breeds necessity and innovation from that competition. As for the air coolers, they're all within a few degrees and mostly doing fine while comprising the bottom third of the chart. This chart shows the time required to reach maximum temperature or steady state under a 200 watt load with a normalized 35 dBA noise level. This mostly demonstrates the ability of liquid coolers to better soak large load spikes, offering the potential to keep thermally dependent clocks, like those operated under Precision Boost 2 or TVB, at higher levels for longer. This chart is mostly a function of the size of the cooler. The EKIO360, unsurprisingly, outperforms the lot at 344 seconds until steady state. Comparatively, the larger air coolers required between 87 and 102 seconds to reach steady state. Without water there to help soak, they fall behind. The NZXT Kraken X72 360 mil unit has again been exposed of an aging pump design and overall poor performance with these slower fan settings, falling behind the Arctic and EK units alike. The EK AIO 240 expectedly lands at the bottom of the liquid coolers and the top of the air coolers. The next test is noise normalized at 40 dBA on an Intel HEDT CPU, our three-year-old test bench, and it's compared against more coolers. Note also the fact that this is a monolithic die in an HEDT platform with a large area IHS has the potential to significantly shuffle some results. 
testing at 40 dBA also changes things, as we've now shifted in a way that the fans with worse static pressure may be able to achieve the minimum pressure required to cool efficiently, whereas 35 dBA can fall behind that threshold for inefficient fans. And we see that materialize here. The EK AIO 360 is functionally equal to the NDXT Kraken X72, X63, and the Corsair H115i Platinum. The other 360s, like the H150i and the H360X3, end up charted ahead, but with an error. Everything we just named is basically within run-to-run variance or error, especially for these older benches, and so we can say that they're equal in this test environment. The EK AIO 240 falls closer to the EK Fluid Gaming 240 and the older Corsair H100i V2. This chart removes the frequency control and makes it the variable instead, while still maintaining voltage controls and fan noise level controls. That means we're now looking at the maximum average all-core frequency permitted by the cooler because Precision Boost 2 is variable contingent upon temperature. The EK AIO 360 leads the chart with a 5 MHz boost over the Liquid Freezer 2 at the same noise level, or about 47 MHz over what's enabled by the big deep cool cooler. Overall then, the value for cooling isn't great monetarily if you're looking at a 360 EK AIO versus an Arctic Liquid Freezer 2. Few things in EK's favor here. One of them, the <laughs> Liquid Freezer is basically not available anymore. Sorry, that's partially our fault, but it's a good product, at least thus far. We can't really test endurance on these things until a lot of people use it, unfortunately. It's not part of the review cycle. But as far as we know, thermally, it's a good, extremely competitive product. It's built well from what we saw in our teardown, and that's why it's not available ever. So that is in, the, in favor of EK, because people aren't going to wait forever, obviously, for a cooler. There's plenty of other options out there. They'll buy those instead, which is unfortunate for Arctic, but that's how it works. Uh, the EK unit does have RGB LEDs, which is definitely important to a lot of people. Not too much for us. This is purely subjective, which uh, I guess I can break rank and use first person here, but I don't like speaking about subjective stuff and reviews because it's just, I mean, you can look at the footage and judge it for yourself. Subjectively and personally, I don't like the acrylic plate on the top. I think it looks like uh, I could have maybe worked with Andrew to make our own version of that in my garage. Now, that said, it doesn't matter what I think if you like how it looks. So you just ignore that if you disagree. But that's one of the points that's different from Arctic, which is blackout, and that's their, their approach to design. So uh, internal seem to be quality. Build quality is overall good. We'll talk about that in the teardown. We had one point of concern about proper cleaning of the radiator. So when these are made, we have factory tour footage. We'll put some on the screen, like from our How a Liquid Cooler is Made video from 2019, where we visited Deep Cools and Cooler Masters factories. But one of the things they do is they purge the radiators. They flush fluid through it a few times to try and get out any of the black paint dust, powder, factory dust, stuff like that. And when we opened it up, we did find some particles starting to get lodged into the microfins. Now, it wasn't terrible. They're actually still in here, too. But there is dust. It is going to affect performance. And the bigger concern we have is, was that from improper cleaning, which is fine if it's only this amount, or was it because there's some kind of degradation within the loop that we're not going to know about for a long time? See again the Enermax coolers where it, it can take a while. It might be a year before that materializes. So we don't know is the answer. But educated guess would be probably didn't clean the radiator properly from the supplier. Uh, and that's the, the more optimistic angle as well. It's, it's pretty uncommon to get catastrophic failures like Enermax. It's possible, but there's a reason they're the only one we've talked about that with in CLCs. The, for the most part, use propylene glycol, a good biocide, and uh, avoid metals that shouldn't really be with each other, and it works out okay. And obviously, CLCs mix metals all the time, and they work just fine for years. So we'll see how it develops. Uh, overall, performance is good. It is a chart topper for the 360 in a technical sense. It's a bit of a shallow victory, but it is technically in the lead, and that's worth something to some people. Uh, it shows that Asetech is aging. Like we said earlier, Asetech's approach of suing everyone on the market for putting a pump on top of the CPU is not going to work out too well for Asetech in the long run, it looks like, because Asetech has stagnated in its approach to design. That's part of being a litigious company like theirs, where they pursue everyone for copy in their designs. And so now that 
aggressive legal stance that Ace Attack has taken has encouraged its competitors to figure out other things like this, which technically EK solution is patent pending, which isn't really marketing as much as it is to say, hey, look, we've got a different patent than Ace Attack. This isn't infringing. And so that's what's going to keep happening. Ace Attack will force innovation by being as litigious as it is, which is good for it in the short term and bad for it in the long term. But that's the cooling solution. The biggest competitor is Arctic's Liquid Freezer 2. That is not made by Ace Attack. It's made by Arctic and whomever their supplier might be. And uh, EK objectively loses in value there versus the 280, but it, you also basically can't buy it. it. It's like a 1600 AF. It's a magical unicorn at this point. I'm trying to get more in, but uh, we'll see. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. This type of content takes a lot of work and we really invest time into verifying our thermal results. You can see our methodology pieces for more on that. So you can go to store.cameraxis.net to support us directly by buying things like our mouse mats, which are on back order and coming in, and the mod mats. We've got dates for those on the site if you want to order them, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.